UConn graduate, for that matter, should absolutely positively have the time value of money formula, one of the most important formulas in all of finance, not necessarily economics, but all of finance, which is under economics, of course. Well, oh, that's not bad one either. <laughs> he said, what's the rule of 72? Yeah, right, right. I was like, um, my name's Michael Jones. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first thing you said, huh? No, it wasn't like that. But yeah, no, I Well, that is a handy, that's a very handy rule to have, too. Probably not quite as needed for this case of problems. So let me see a rock solid, maybe I should make this a little, a little test here. Let me see a rock solid formula for the time value of money. I'm not seeing it everywhere here. I'm seeing something going on. <laughs> Got some right components. But Is this what you're looking for? You're looking for the money. Yes. But the thing is, we can't do that because. Well, you need to think about that. It's a payment. It's a payment. So you're stuck, you're stuck. I want to see how many stucks we have. Stuck, stuck, Michael had it. John, stuck, you got further back like, from I just have the single payment. Like, we can't do anything except have the annuity, which we were never talking about. Okay, well, I can live with that. So Chelsea's on. the formula. No, I, well, I was looking for the oh. present value, just expressing it, flipping your, doing a little for the other way. Stuck, we have to stuck. Ooh, you're getting close. Uh, you got kind of the right components, but you're stuck. All right, we got two people. Let's see. Chelsea and Michael, you win the prize today for extra credit. Come on up, right down on the board over here. You get the blue, you get the orange. Nice work. I just kind of want to see both of your styles because you actually both did it a little bit differently. I'd like you to write what you have in this paper. Okay. Oh, she got real fancy. That mathematical brain. Okay. Um, so. If we're getting $8,200 and $25 for the next 20 years, do we just put 8,225 divided by 22? Or how is the problem structured? We'd have it, to do that for each. Year. For each one, good. So this is, what Michael's got here is for only time period N. So if the problem was, I'm gonna be getting $10,000 in 10 years, 10,000 divided by 1 plus i raised to the 10th power, that's the present value of that chunk. But if it was $10,000 10 years from now, 11 years from now, and 12, 12 years from now, three payments of 10,000, it would actually be 10,000 divided by this raised to the 10th, plus 10,000 divided by this raised to the 11th, plus 10,000 divided by this raised to the 12th power. Okay? So that's, that's the basic chunk of it. Now help me out here. Um, help me out here, Chelsea. You want to explain what's going on with this? Oh. Well, I just forgot to add it. Well, yeah. What what is this? Annuity. Okay, annuity. So that so as you put um, annuity, which mm, almost would be kind of potentially wrong, I guess, right? If you're thinking of a fixed payment over a long period of time. That is. We're working on this all. If it's a single payment? If it's a single payment, then that's what you do. Would you call that an annuity, though? No. If it's a single payment in the future? No, Probably not. No, I was going to 80. Yeah. Okay. So, one you need to bring back to so then this, you're saying if you put the 8225 in this, you wouldn't get the right answer? Is this the right formula or not? I'm thinking, if I forgot, I'm just going to do so. I think you, you need to get the present value of the 8225 anyway. So yeah. I was just trying to find the present value of the Of oh, when? But what's an annuity? An annuity, annuity is a fixed payment. payment over so is this the right way to capture the present value of a fixed payment over a number of time periods? It's one. Wait. It's one. No. 
I kind of just gave you the answer. The answer is no, it's not correct. No, but there is a formula that A angle is. You're close. Yeah, I'm doing A angle, A and angle. Yeah. All right, let's not get too crazy. Let's not get too crazy. Here's how I'm going to fix you up. I'm going to fix you up. So if this was an annuity, you're missing just the sum factor, just like what I did here. Yeah, but there's another equation you can do that's not a sum of them all. That condenses it down? Yeah, so okay. then you're not having if it's a perpetuity, then it, then it becomes easier, and it's just one over I. So, okay. All right. So, I like my brain kind of thinks this way a little bit more. This is fine. It's step this. If this is a simple sum, I really, I wouldn't call it an annuity. What's your negative end thing? What's, your, that, what's that negative? Put it underneath. I just want to hear it from Chelsea. What's the negative end thing? What does that do? It just counts it. Like he has it over one plus n, and I just have a negative n instead of having a negative n to the Okay, just want to make sure we're clear. Not everybody's on the same math level, right? So that's just this sucker raised over here to the negative n. It's just a different way of representing it, right? Kind of very So. Yeah. Well, I have the accounting part of value formula, but you didn't count that right. You've got it perfect. Let's. Yeah, this what is it? This is what I have the accounting. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Oh, Everybody gets extra credit. <laughs> Yeah, that's not really the formula. That's using a table. So you're you're just describing a statistic. Just saying. So. All right. So. What do you got now? We're just getting started on this problem. I wasn't planning on taking the whole hour on this problem, but. But it is important to getting back to the fundamentals. This is a formula you guys should have. Each time period gets treated independently. So if there's multiple payments like there is with an annuity, then the full-blown formula would look something more like this. What's that? Well, that's that's what I want you guys to think about. So this is the correct this is the the correct idea here between between these two. And this is actually I should be using an I or a K here. Maybe I'll do a K. equation and expand it out. First time period is one, second time period, and then maybe you can do a little dot, dot, dot action. Start with your first payment is 8225 divided by 1 plus i raised to the 1. 
plus, so following that formula, raise to the two, raise to three. And you're right, it would be zero. The first one would be zero. The first one we got today, so it would be zero. That's right. And it's two. It's you're overthinking it. It's 20, it's 20 payments. I'm right, having so fun, John. It's zero, one, one, two, 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 one
I interest rate causes you to be indifferent between the 8225 or the 100,000. So write out a kind of a short little couple sentences, maybe use, you can use a little math if you want or something else. At this point, you're really answering the question, which option should you choose? You are a consultant now. You are Somebody has come to you for help and says, hey, should I do this one or should I do this one? You're answering that question right now in an email to them. Need some help? Raise your hand. I'll come around and give you a nudge. for a particular person. He says you can't. <laughs> so Ross, are you going to watch season three of House of Cards? Oh yeah. Been waiting a year for it. So. Are you a fan? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, I even showed a short clip of it. Um, what was that? Money and banking or something? Oh. Yeah. oh. Yeah. No. I don't know what it was. Which one? It's about the peach. I don't. It was related. It was related to a public goods issue. It might have been international. So let's turn those in if you're, I guess, a couple of people still writing. So, how did you guys articulate that? If you, because a 
way that the problem is set up, the annuity would increase in its present value if the percentage of the, current, the interest rate was to decrease. So if your personal interest rate is less than 6%, then you should take the annuity. Otherwise, you can get more in the market return and you can have greater interest with just the lump sum like that's set over 20 years. Okay. Did you guys phrase it differently than John? Somebody else jump in? Colby, how'd you do it? So if you get six percent, if you get um, ten percent, what happens to the value of this stream? Does it go? Is it a, is it going to end up being above a hundred or less than a hundred? Less, right? So then it's giving you the sign of don't do it, take the hundred. So that's kind of the signal that we want to use. All right, good. So let's watch the rest of Allison here, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we got coming up on. This thing. So we started, John Allison's the author of our book here. We just got about, uh, I don't know, even like three minutes to finish off where we left off with his southern southern accent. I found him to be kind of a likable, no-nonsense guy, so I hope... Uh, Correct. Uh, in addition, the only way the U.S. government can run its massive deficits is because of the Federal Reserve's ability to print money. Today, the Federal Reserve couldn't print money. Uh, uh, no telling what interest rates would be on U.S. I don't think U.S. Could, could actually, get, it, it would not be credit worthy if it could, if it couldn't print money, and that creates a huge temptation for politicians, right? Grim Republicans and Democrats. I don't believe we'll ever discipline fiscal policy until we deal with monetary policy. Then we had some very specific errors by the Federal Reserve that led to the, the recent uh, uh, financial crisis. For, in, in the late. 1990s, early 2000s, Alan Greenspan, the head of the Federal Reserve, he'd been there a long time. He wanted to be a hero, but then he's He's getting ready to retire, we were having a minor correction in the 2000s. So Greenspan wants to go out on a good note, so he starts lowering interest rates, effect, which is the effect of, of printing money. And he, lowers, he creates negative real interest rates. So you can borrow it less than the inflation rate, and you can borrow it dramatically less than the, 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 the appreciation rate on, on housing. Which incented a huge investment in housing, which you borrow at such low interest rates. And then, at, right at the end of his term, uh, Greenspan realizes he's screwed up, and his, he and his successor start raising interest rates very rapidly. And they create something called an inverted yield curve. Now, an inverted yield curve is an unnatural phenomenon; it never occurs in markets. Only the Fed can do it. What an inverted yield curve is means that short-term rates are higher than long-term. Now, if you're going to make an investment, if you're going to invest for the long term, you're going to want a higher interest rate in the short term because it's riskier, and so that's liquid. So markets never do that. Only the Federal Reserve can do that. Why that matters is banks make money by borrowing short term long. That's, how, that's their whole business. And if you create an inverted yield curves, banks have negative margins. They're buying watermelons for $10 and selling them for eight. Not a great business model, right? Now, the banking business is quirky in that you can get higher interest rates by taking more risk. So most of the bad loans, were, it's a long-term trend, but they went exponential under this negative uh, inverted interest rate, which was the longest in U.S. history. And, and one reason that happened, at the same time Bernanke had inverted interest rates, he was claiming, the Federal Reserve was claiming, there was not going to be a recession, that good times were going to go up, up forever. So he created a huge incentive for banks to take an inordinate risk cl and claim that good times would go on forever. Um, in a certain fundamental sense, we could have mathematically had a bubble without the Fed printing money. Where, that's one question that the state has never answered. Where did the money come from <laughs> if the Federal Reserve didn't provide it? Simple, simple question. Second uh, fact was FDIC. FDIC insured bank deposits. It sounds like a good thing if bank deposits are insured. It destroys market risk. I'll give you a simple example. BDT operated in Atlanta. Uh, we competed with a number of community banks. We took over one of those community banks after it failed. And it looked like a lot of community banks had failed. Uh, it was 10 guys, 12 guys that had been in the hotel business, the motel business, got together, and they started a bank, they put in a little bit of capital, and they leveraged it radically by buying certificates of deposit from average consumers at very high interest. All right, so, let's turn to talk. Pull out your books. 
Good evening and welcome to tonight's lecture on uh, principal leadership. It's good to see uh, you all at a, uh, at a, uh, a lecture on that particular topic. Start with the introduction. This is pretty short, short reading, right? Um, so for uh, for Friday, uh, just chapter two, which is again fairly short. All of the stuff is posted. If you guys feel like you want to read ahead and just knock them out, it's all posted on Blackboard, so you can make your comments and kind of be done with with that section. And then we'll just kind of peel through uh, different chapters as we as we move on. So. Um, Introduction. Thoughts on that? Do you know where he was in college? What's that? Where did he go? In college? Where did he go? Ah, uh, boy, I don't remember. That would be interesting. To and I, I, I don't yeah, think he has. I don't think he has yeah. more than a master's yeah, I, degree either. I'm pretty sure he does not have a like a PhD or anything because he just got into the banking business. Oh yeah, big time. There's gonna be a whole. There's, gonna, there's a whole yeah. chapter on that later. Yeah. 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 In the inside cover, yeah. And what caught your attention and other things that caught your attention in the introduction? Or well, let's say, because it really just kind of speaks of him, what he's done. Now, is that getting into chapter one, which we can kind of, oh, or I mean, we can talk about, so chapter one's got the fundamental themes, which he really lays out. I think that was, that was one of them. That's okay. We can, we can do that. Yeah. So he's got that kind of no-nonsense approach, and that's, that's kind of the way the rest of the book goes. And, and he's going to get into a lot of specific details. Like I feel like we were kind of inside the banking system uh, and really learning some of the nuts and bolts of how some of these top-down policies play out in reality. You know, and, and that's what's kind of, he really does bring kind of a neat insight. No? I just, I, I, oh, he says that he's like, I'm not going to get into the mathematics of yeah, this. I want to talk a lot. I don't want to get clouded up in it, which I, I get that. I understand. I just kind of wish he would make almost uh, some sort of reference of like maybe a footnote or something today where you could see you say, well, just because, I don't know, I like seeing proof. Just, I like to see at least another thing I study proof one way or the other. I, I think he will have m maybe some of the evidence that you're talking about where yeah. there's estimates of X amount of million dollars. And, and so it, when he says that, it's not that there won't be some numbers, but but right. probably more focus for sure on, on 
the human action part and incentives. No, I mean, naturally, no, that makes sense, especially since, as you said, he's working more on the philosophical side of economics as opposed to the economic side. It's just, I don't know, just because that's the way that we prove things in economics, it's kind of nice to have it. Scouts and Helms and figure so, Yeah, Scouts and Dinesk and figure numbers had his charts to show you. I mean, he backed it up everything that he said. Right. So, there, but there's, um, so let's see, how should I approach this? This is kind of a big topic, but it's a fun one. Um, some of the uh, Austrian economists um, think that some of those more formal mathematical treatments are absolute trash. Like, that doesn't get us anywhere. It's what Hayek called the, the fatal conceit. To even think that I can mathematically model this extremely complex environment um, is absurd and causes us to do things that had we, if we would accept that we can't actually get to where we think we can get with mathematics, we'd be a lot better off. So that's kind of a theme, certainly would fall more into Allison's point of view um, that's competing lines of thought, of course, um, and I kind of fall in the middle, to be honest with you, because I, I know that um, some of these sophisticated mathematical models can be beneficial in certain ways, but I think they do get detrimental when it reaches to the point of the very top to where they think they can do more than they can, you know, because, because the sophisticated economic model told me that if I change interest rates this much, and if I reduce tax rates this much, and if I increase government spending this much, then here's the result. Because yeah. my formula told me it would work out that way. That's where it gets detrimental, and that's where I, I agree. So it, I'm not one to throw out all of the math, because I think I know that there's value in its right place. Right. Probably more at a micro level, though, not at the macroeconomic level, but more at the micro level. Um, so. And then no economist gets away from looking at the numbers, though, after the fact of 800 million was spent here, you know, and, and to try to decompose, dissect what the issue was. Um, so when somebody who's savvy with economics says we're not going to do m math, we're still going to do numbers. S to some people, numbers means math. To an economist, math means sophisticated means that, <laughs> that made some of you uncomfortable. And, that, and, and that, that's kind of just a, a small uh, dose of what economist brains mean with math, so. Okay, good, other things. Which, which point was that? That's in five, it's the last point. Five. On page seven. And oh. then you continue to go into the academics point of visiting academic freedom, freedom and how some academics believe that business people can continue to innovate and create wealth despite the voluntary of government regulations, when in reality the government regulations prevent these innovative activities. I definitely think he had a point in that. At the same time, it felt like almost, it almost felt like he was trying to rally people. trying to rally them around the idea of like that we're going against the intellectual elites, we're going against all of uh, these other people, and uh, we're doing this. And it just, I don't know, it, it, it felt almost uncomfortable for me just reading that because it felt so similar to what I've seen. Because you want to become one of those intellectual elites. <laughs> well, they might be that. Well, they might be that. It's, it just felt so similar to what I've seen, you know, in my own hometown, where it's like, oh, you're going off to college, you aren't going to learn anything, and uh, you know, you got to do the working man thing, and this is what you like. I don't know, it, it felt very almost propaganda, which is probably a little, I, I don't know, it was, I definitely want to hear what he has to say, don't get me wrong, it was, mm -hmm. that was, whenever I was reading that, I was like, okay, if you're going to make these claims, these following chapters better have to really prove. Yep, good point, I, I, and I think that's what will, is yet to be seen in our discussion, but he, he kind of teased things up, I think you're right as far as sucking you in, and a little bit of a, you know, what's this book about, and, 
wants to make it attractive and knows that some people might read that and stop if they don't like what they hear or whatever. So there's probably a little salesmanship in there too, I'm sure. Okay, who else? What other one of these points did you like? I'd like to talk about each one of the points, so which one did you like? interesting tension in, in capitalism, right, and that, that we'll see kind of coming up. We've talked about it in other classes that... Um, I like to comment on Tony Sosa, Sosa's part of capitalism. It kind of reminds me, I just did a paper over the causes of the financial crisis and whether or not the IMF is capable of all that. But what's more important is that it reminds me of something else on the research that I read, where it said um, that basically the <coughs> net effect of bailouts was that all the gains from uh, the bank's actions were privatized and the bankers were going to end up with it. With the move towards socialism. But their losses are going to be socialized and not just with for the last few out, but with preceding ones that had happened. Because it's not like this was the first time that any of the entire financial institutions have been bailed out. In fact, you know, we've read about it in the book that there's one in 87 where they're trying to too big to fail and actually court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I've been even changing my lingo a little bit to say cronyism rather than crony capitalism. But those two things have been labeled different things But because uh, uh, it, it starts to bring, well, that's the problem with capitalism. Well, there might be things we can do to eliminate cronyism and support capitalism. So the, crony, the cronyism that comes about might be due to the other factors. So cronyism is uh, big, gut, big business, big government getting cozy in bed together. It's uh, kind of the easy way to to kind of broad brush it. What's that? Collusion. collusion, yeah, it is in a sense. It probably uh, legal collusion, because collusion, you know, um, if you are able to pay your senator enough to get a bill passed that favors you, it becomes law. It, it's legal plunder. You guys remember that book? I, I liked that one. Um, I know not everybody enjoyed some of those old readings, but the plunder book from Entrepreneurial Class, where he talked about what does plunder mean of stealing, taking from one uh, person yeah, there was to plunder, get, it was yeah. Versus, it was plunder versus uh, liberty or something. Yeah, and so, um, you know, this this guy and, and other people are, are all more about individual freedoms to not lead to that limited, limited government type of stuff, and, and we'll get a chance to investigate and you guys develop your own philosophies on, on what you think about it, so. And this is non-mainstream, so part of the reason I like to bring this you know, the stuff we have in the textbook is more mainstream. This is not mainstream. So I like to kind of present you guys with all kinds of um, viewpoints that are out there so you can start to make up your own mind on, on how you feel. You call Paul mainstream? Or, I, I don't know. I've, I've seen he's a, a, yeah, he's I've a mainstream say, economist. I know. I've seen, uh, I've, like, I've seen like, higher-level academics, I guess. And he would mainstream be one of those conceited intellectuals. Yeah, I would. Just call, well, they call him basically just a political pop boss. More or less, not even starting out of economics, he was personally doing personal theories with Paul Krugman. Uh, quote unquote economic factor. Like he would be, the, I guess, the hopefully, I think people think I'm right, but so what, hopefully the left of the Chinese. Actually, that's a, a Krugman's going to debate one of the free market guys. Uh, he's kind of a hated guy among the Austrian right. well, economists, I mean, and I he's going to come to a conference called uh, Freedom Fest in July to uh, Vegas. I've gone to that event before, or not that, I've gone to that conference before. I didn't go last year, but I would, I would like to go to that again. All right, so other ones before we wrap up. Government policy is the primary cause of the financial crisis. Oh, it's uh, where you said how the country is going bankrupt, bankrupt Right. That last one with Argentina, yeah, that's a pretty, that's a pretty bold statement, that's right? Pretty recent. And, and it's fairly true. Uh, I had a, a colleague in the economics department up at Iowa State that was from Argentina, and uh, Argentina just kind of imploded that way. And so I'd like to think that the United States would never even come close to that, but 
well, you just start to see the little bit of creep here and there, and you just start to, to question. Not, not unless there's, there's some uh, people who champion the cause and might even be a little luck of the dice that there does, there's not a rise of some sort of faction, because that's what happens in those countries. A small faction of people, I mean, we've got Hitler, we've got um, the things going on in the Ukraine, you've got these um, small factions of people that somehow rise, get the people under their belt, and before you know it, they're in power, and you've got an authoritarian regime in place. I guess first couple of three points wherever he was talking about how the government creates the books and real estate, how the government causes gestures, etc. I like I actually no, I found that to be fairly consistent with a lot of the research I just done on the financial crisis. So basically across the board you can Well I think we'll see that we'll see that come out in more of his chapter stuff too on on what he's saying and, and kind of why. All right, let's call it a day there. Good. Um, so chapter two for Friday.